banking is a derived industry um, in that uh, I know very few people that delight at taking a loan, making a payment, buying insurance, but I know that the delight at paying their school fee, child, child school fees, uh, buying a fridge for their health, buying a home for shelter, uh, buying a truck for the logistics of a business. Um, so it's a derived industry in, in that sense. Um, and so there's always a fundamental reason for why uh, a human being um, uh, takes on a financial transaction, uh, buys a product or, or transacts. And so all the challenges and opportunities that are associated with banking arrive, are derived from economic activity and they're dependent on, on the economy. I think the second framing point is that um, financial services businesses don't sit on an ivory tower uh, and are somehow separate from society. They're an inextricable part of the environment uh, and, and society. And so despite many people's anxieties about, uh, about banks and bankers, uh, we don't shape society, but society shapes us. And the opportunities and challenges that banks face uh, are created by people's expectations and demands in that sense. And to an equally large extent, uh, what banks do is determined by laws and regulations. Uh, in our case, people in Pretoria. The short-term outlook is not good. Uh, it's not good. Just as the world was starting to recover from a one in a century pandemic, uh, we now faced with the consequences of the most devastating war Europe has seen for 75 years. Um, and I don't know about you, but uh, for me, it brings to mind Hamlet's uh, famous line. Um, well, the line from Hamlet, uh, which is, when sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions, right? And these big battalions of bad news are causing severe negative shocks to the world economy. For example, uh, the large financial institutions uh, organizing body called the International Institute of Finance uh, just revised their forecasts for the world economy. They're saying now uh, it, we won't grow at 4.6% in 2022. It looks rather like at 2.3% with growth in the United States slowing uh, to about 2%, and China's growth decelerating and growing at roughly 4%, and then Europe uh, being the laggards uh, at 1%. Uh, the war and the subsequent sanctions are also clearly causing uh, severe pressure. Uh, we're seeing it in the oil price, which is likely to remain at above $100 per barrel for as long as the war in the Ukraine persists. The war is also going to put strains on uh, supply chains that actually had not recovered uh, post the pandemic. So think here that we definitely going to face shortages of fertilizer during the course of this year with incredible consequences for food production. Um, and we're also facing shortages in semiconductors. Um, Europeans will undoubtedly be paying a lot more for heating and many face gas shortages. The price of aluminium, copper, gold, titanium, palladium and nickel will remain elevated with substantial impacts on industrial sectors like the automotive industry. Uh, and this will be particularly severe in Europe. It's also very concerning, I think, that Ukraine and Russia uh, together account for a quarter of global wheat trade. A quarter, I mean, it's extraordinary. And roughly 12% of calories consumed globally. Now, turning specifically to our beloved continent, uh, the picture is complex, uh, but also brighter in parts compared to the global outlook. So our economists at Standard Bank uh, don't currently expect a significant slowdown in African GDP growth. Uh, we still expect growth at just over 4%. But of course, 
a long war or a widening conflict would do more serious damage. So it really is dependent on how long lasting the uh, conflict in Eurasia is. Commodity prices uh, will be the main channel through which the war affects uh, African economies. So oil exporters, uh, for example, are gonna benefit. And remember the point I made, South Africa is gonna benefit in terms of trade because of coal, um, pl platinum, uh, and other exports that uh, we'll benefit from. That, of course, is also dependent on how quickly people can get stuff to the ports and out of our ports. Um, it's a double-edged sword, I guess. However, uh, the continent is gonna face severe food insecurity, particularly in places like Tanzania, uh, which are dependent on uh, imports from, from that part of the world. Africa remains the poorest region in the world, and that's the case both relatively and absolutely. Uh, in fact, over the next few decades, uh, thanks to the rapid growth enjoyed by Asia, extreme poverty is going to remain the exclusive preserver of our beloved continent, unfortunately. It's horrible to contemplate, but it's true. So we've got a lot of catching up to do. Banks must continue to look for opportunities to accelerate inclusion and uh, uh, contribute to sustainability. By inclusion, uh, I mean both inclusion for poorer people into the formal economy, but also the inclusion of the African continent into global value chains and supply chains and uh, economic activity. Turning to sustainability, here I'm referring both to social and environmental sustainability. And for us at Standard Bank, the two concepts are inextricably intertwined. Um, on the environmental side of things, uh, there's no question that if we want to avoid uh, an accelerating series of environmental disasters and catastrophes, Africa and, of course, the whole world needs to move as quickly as possible towards using only sustainable energy. It just makes so much sense. If you have any doubt, contemplate the terrible human tragedy that we've just witnessed in KZN. Um, and it makes an eloquent case for environmental sustainability, more so than any rhetoric uh, one could master. What does an incumbent need uh, to compete? I'd venture to say, at the very least, you've got to have a strong brand, and you have to be able to successfully defend it. Secondly, you have to have sufficient digital skills and resources. Scale matters in financial services. Hence my suggestion to you, that uh, even in banking and financial services, fortune favors the big battalions. You've got to have the financial resources and the capability to, to, to compete. And then lastly, do you have the digital platforms to be able to compete? One of the features of banking is that you can grow either by uh, uh, market penetration, so you increase your distribution channels, open branches, ATMs, etc. Product proliferation, you increase your products and services, either by yourself or in partnership with others. Um, thirdly, by geographic expansion, you go into new territories, uh, and or by way of acquisition, you you know you buy businesses. And Standard Bank has historically grown by way of all of those methods with a result that we represented in 20 countries in roughly 75% of sub-Saharan GDP. However, the bulk of that is mainly in wholesale banking because the infrastructure necessary to run a retail bank takes a long time to build and is incredibly expensive. And I keep saying, so the big techs, the fintechs, and the telcos, they know that they need to write those checks for the purposes of entry into, into the space. So it's mainly through wholesale banking. So if you look at the network of Standard Bank outside South Africa, it is largely wholesale, and we are still building our retail capability. In places like Nigeria, we're still continuing to sell more products, build the infrastructure, uh, look for partnerships. The same applies to our operations uh, in East Africa. And then, of course, we look for opportunities to buy, uh, where people are selling banks where they are leaving. Um, but because 
you have to be strict in your capital allocation. You can't overpay for these, for these businesses. We're looking to grow in the Wemu region, West, uh, West Africa. Uh, we have an operation in Cote d'Ivoire, um, and that environment looks quite interesting. Um, we're not represented in the Maghreb, so th the north, we're looking to grow there as well. Uh, but it's a fiercely competitive environment. Right. The Moroccans, for example, are very competitive, as are the Egyptians, and they're all moving the Moroccans down the west coast, the Egyptian down the east coast, and then the Nigerians also continuing to grow. My point is that the competition between the incumbent banks is fierce, it's with the international players, as well as with the fintechs, the telcos, and the, and the, um, and the big techs. Uh, but growth then into that main market uh, is difficult. It's expensive and you have to look for innovative ways to, to, to grow there.